right? Okay, so okay, cool. Okay, so yeah, hello everyone, hello everyone from GA and uh, myself DJ. You can also call me Thananjay, but I think DJ might be simpler to uh, pronounce because my name has a lot of syllabies, right? Uh, this is a small illustration that I did like long time back of a milk carton actually flexing itself. And you can find me on Twitter, uh, on Medium as well. I tend to be on Medium a lot of times. I write articles, I write uh, a lot of information stuff. Uh, sometimes with the students, I'm connecting with uh, students or fellow designers. And if they have some doubts, rather than just connecting with that one person, I also go to Medium a lot of times or Twitter and write my thoughts over there. So you can go ahead and uh, look me up with that handle that I've shared over here. Um, just to share a little bit in my nutshell, I feel like uh, these are some of the things which every designer that I have, I know likes as well, but me in general, I really love anime. So anything related to Naruto, Hajime no Ippo, or like, you know, uh, My Hero Academia, those kind of things. Like I love those things, love those uh, stuff. And plus uh, Star Wars, uh, I'm a huge fan of Star Wars and action movies and adventure stuff. Uh, I also got into like anime and this manga culture because I started learning Japanese long time back. Uh, and I'm still learning. Like I never got to a phase where I was like very dedicated and very serious about learning Japanese. But at one point of time, I started, I wanted to work in Japan. I wanted to start my life in Japan as a designer, uh, but I couldn't do that, unfortunately. So that's one of the things that is not off my bucket list even now. Um, so how I got here to, to start with, um, I have like nine years, nine plus years of experience working in the design industry. So I was previously working in India as a designer and I started like my first job to be very honest in a Singapore currency sort of a thing. My first dollar, first uh, job paid me like hundred dollars per month. Uh, that was my salary for my first job. And, uh, I, I started building myself up. I met a lot of mentors, uh, during my journey. And that's what I'm going to just like show you what went through till now, uh, from India to Singapore. So I started electronics engineering, uh, electronics and communication engineering, um, like nine, eight, nine years back. Mm -hmm. And then. And then I started as a .NET web developer. So I was doing like JavaScript, HTML, CSS, all these sort of things. So uh, I was working with developers in a banking sort of an industry, in a banking sort of a setup. And then I got into visual design. So uh, one of my friend who is now working at Amazon, he told me to join a startup, go and join a startup because that is where most of the learning will happen. Uh, if I go and work in a bigger company, maybe the learnings would be so, so 50, 50, but then working in a startup, I'll be in the water all the time. Uh, and that's why that's where the most of the learning would happen. Um, and I continued to be a visual designer for a while. Uh, and after that I learned so much and I was always, like I said, I was always interested in like anime, manga, like Walt Disney stuff and all these sort of things. So I got an opportunity to see what an art director role looks like in a, in a messaging company. So I was working at a company called hike messenger, which is equivalent to like, let's say telegram or, you know, WhatsApp in India. And I was leading the art direction for stickers. So I was working with a lot of studios, like animation studios, like, you know, Prana studios that worked on life of Pi and these kind of things. And they were just like creating stickers for us. I was working with these really phenomenal artists that were from around the world, uh, making stickers for the company. And then I went back to experience design. So in my current role, also in my previous company, I was working as an experienced designer because I did, I felt like, uh, art direction as a whole did not fill me up enough. So, so what I want to want you guys to take away from this is that don't like at least, at least early in the start of your career, don't shy away from, you know, trying out different things. Like it's very important to try out different things, uh, before you finally understand that, okay, this is what I actually want to do. Because if you're like very rigid about 
you know i just want to do this i just want to do ux design i just want to do visual design uh, then you won't be able to explore a lot of things and maybe if you start exploring a lot of things you might end up being at a place which you never envisioned in the starting right but to do that you need to be very open towards feedback you need to be very open towards you know understanding if you would want to try different things you would want to try new things be it development design branding marketing i don't know like i've worked in so many startups now till now that i might have to in one of my startups in the first startup that i worked in my founder also made me do cold calling sales calls to everyone in the you know like they gave me a like a list of 100 phone numbers and i called every one of them uh just to sell something and that was an experience once i went through that experience i knew that i don't want to do that ever again right so so i mean you need to be able to do that uh, to basically call yourself like yes this is the path that i am going to be following for the rest of my life or for the foreseeable future so i worked in a so in a mix of b2b as well as for b2c companies as well as a few with the animation studios i worked with the animation studios as well as did a little bit of branding and you know like marketing stuff and i definitely have found a sweet spot like i know how to basically work in like a b2b company as well as in a b2c company and how how to bring different kind of expertise and different kind of design patterns to like a b2b company or a b2c company depending upon where they want where the business wants to lead in the next 5 or 10 years so in my current company where i'm working uh, uh i'm working at zenior which is a telecom company which allows you to which allows other telecom companies like for example we are a platform based saas company and we allow telecom companies like singtel star hub all of these sort of companies to basically help their uh, dispatchers or their people to coordinate their workforce so what i mean by that is uh, suppose you pick up your phone and you say oh i want like a singtel or a star hub connection broadband connection set up at my home tomorrow uh, but that's 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 it from your side from a customer side that you have given a time you have given a date you have given at what time the technician should come to your house and set it up for you but there's a lot that goes behind the scene where there's a lot of inventory warehousing all of that that goes and an allocation of a technician to your house that comes in and uh, you know installs that router installs that fiber optic cable so zenior allows you to manage all of those things zenior allows you to manage give you a software or a platform so that you can manage all of your workforce but i don't do the, all of that at zenior my role is very different uh, i actually i actually design tools for citizen developers so my role is to design tools for developers as well as for citizen developers uh, what i mean by the term citizen developer is that i go and we tap into a customer success team taps into a company and they tell you that okay um, these are the people in the third party company which are able to do coding which are able to do some sort of like small uh, lifting of code and like developing application and when they can do some sort of training with us to understand our tools our machinery and they can basically develop their own features for their own platform or for their own company right so what happens when i design better tools for citizen developers uh, it helps telecom companies uh, build things faster so let's say i develop a tool to basically deploy a feature very fast or build a feature very fast if i make this feature available to developers in a company like singtel let's say since singtel developers will come in and they can build things faster so that they can you those features can be used in singtel processes let me know if that makes sense uh, it's kind of little bit complex and you know if singtel can build better applications or better features for their technicians for their dispatchers for their coordinators then they can manage their workforce better which is a win win situation for all of us so if they can manage their workforce better we can retain them onto our systems better or for longer duration so this is this is what my background is so far but then i'll be coming down to my design process so uh in terms of my design process 
that I've been following uh, over a course of last five, six years is this, which is that I collect all the point of, uh, point of views or POVs and I convert that to different iterations, right? And then I go and test out these iterations in the market and then I do this all over again where I'm like again working through my iterations, like taking certain parts of my iteration onto the production. How I do this is first, when I get like a lot of point of views, I can, uh, I convert those point of views to like a discovery documentation. And what I do during this discovery phase is that I do some sort of competitor research, user research. I do like stakeholder interviews or, you know, management interviews. I also gather information uh, in an unstructured way so that I can go and talk to like 50 developers uh, unstructurally. I have some questions. I ask them, they have some answers. I take all of that in a discovery documentation and basically build that discovery documentation. What that happens, what happens after the discovery phase is that I can convert all the discovery that I've done or all the competitor research and the stakeholder interviews that I've conducted into data, into hard data, which I can then use to actually create user flows, sketches, wireframes, high fidelity prototypes or mockups. So in a way, um, I, I remember a tweet by one of the designers that I follow is that your work would be very, very in any company that you work in. If you have access to the users, if you can actually go and research uh, your user views or your use, user research can be done by conducting interviews or by doing some sort of qualitative or quantitative tests, you know, you can actually get your done work, work done faster. Because imagine if your users are actually telling you that we want this, we want this, we want this rather than you basically telling the management that, Oh, I want this or the management telling you, Oh, I want this feature. So what that happens is your guarantee of success is very high. Your guarantee of success is very high because the, the met the stuff that is coming in your product is coming directly from the users who are going to be using your product. So always remember that whenever you are getting to design a feature or a, you know, project or anything, conduct some sort of like a very, even if it's a very light user testing or user feedback round, you should be able to do that so that you know exactly where you are going uh, with your ideas. Are they something that is completely not aligned with your users? Because it happens a lot of times that uh, product managers or developers want to build something really cool, but they never validated that with the user. What happens is after six months of building everything, you just like figure out that whatever you might have built is of no use to the user. Right. That's why user research is an important part of the process. Uh, today I'll be covering mostly the discovery part. So I'll be just showing what my discovery documentation looks like. And you can actually build the, you can use this discovery documentation template for your projects, even for your freelance projects or your, you know, like concept projects. And what this will help you to do is that you will be able to create a UX diary for your projects. And then basically after the end of the project, you can convert this UX diary into a proper portfolio or a proper portfolio website. It will be very easy to do after you have seen the template of the discovery documentation. So as far as the tools are concerned, I'm, I'm using all of these tools right now. Uh, so, uh, can anyone recognize the tools from the icons itself? Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so the first one is like confluence. So I'm using confluence for any kind of documentation, uh, any kind of UX diary, everything I put on confluence so that everyone in my team can basically have access to it. I'm using zoom calls for basically transcripts, creating transcripts, usability studies and quantitative and even qualitative interviews. Conducting all of that is done completely on, uh, you know, zoom. I also have recordings of everyone that I have done user research or user testing with so that I can create those and convert, take those recordings and convert them to evidence that I can show to the management of the stakeholders of the company. I'm using this tool called whimsical. Uh, which is mostly for wireframes and flows. Uh, try give, uh, try using it. It's a pretty simple tool. 
it has a limit for free users but you can play around with that free limit if you're like a little bit smart about it and for for all version control stuff i'm using abstract because if you're having a large team then something like version control makes a lot of sense uh, which is only possible through one of the industry leading tools which is abstract then for prototypes and mockups i'm using sketch or a plugin called overflow which is over sketch where you can export your sketch prototypes or sketch you know mockups to uh, overflow and then overflow will allow you to stitch all of them together into a prototype which can be presentable to the developers as well as to the pm you can do the same thing by using only sketch by using sketch cloud and uh, like second last i'm like using zeppelin for developer handoff so every design that i create goes to zeppelin and i uh, basically send it to the developer they, they can look over the specs they can look at the padding spacing the colors that i'm using in my particular document or the mockups and they know exactly what to code and then for slack i'm using slack as a very important tool because i const i do all my unconstructed chats and all my question answer sessions all my polling and everything else on slack so we yeah, i'm also working with the design team our, our design team at zena are currently also working on a process to convert like all of these things like like sketch zeppelin and abstract will be taken away uh, and you know put into this new tool called figma which is the new kid on the block uh, the thing is figma is like a single tool which has everything in it like it has like three tools you can easily replace three tools with this one tool uh um, why i'm actually showing this slide is there are two reasons for this slide uh one is that you when you are applying for a new company or when you are applying for a company where you want to work make sure that you find out which tools this company uh, designers actually use what what is helpful in that way is that imagine if i want to work at zenior or if i want to work at let's say google microsoft and you if through linkedin messages or through uh, some sort of research you understand that oh um google is using atlassian google is using sketch or google is using figma what you can do is that you can actually show your expertise by learning those tools and putting that in your resume at the time of applying will help you to basically be stand out so they will realize that oh this person already knows these tools which we are we using already so we don't need to teach this person we don't need this person doesn't come with come up with a baggage where we have to basically go for a training for this person plus tools are very uh, non important in design as well because tools keep increasing like the number of tools that you see over here right now i might be removing or adding a new tool every now and then over here and you should be really open towards learning a new tool very fast as a designer you should be able to learn a new tool very fast because every now and then in the design industry the tools keep moving like today there is sketch tomorrow there is like figma like one month or one year later you will have some other tool which is coming onto the block which might be helpful in your field but you shouldn't be like very you know compartmentalized saying that oh i just want to learn photoshop i know only photoshop i just know i just know sketch i don't know figma those kind of things you should be open towards learning new tools because at least in our industry like the number of new tools that are coming up are like very fast like new tools crop, crop up every day right so now i'll be going towards the discovery documentation uh should i pause here for a moment uh, just to answer some questions stefani does anyone have any questions so far um so far in the chat we don't have any questions yet but just checking with everyone i guess not yet um dj we can move forward with the next topic okay cool so discovery documentation so the thing that i do with discovery documentation is really important because all of my project starts with a discovery documentation in a confluence page so the thing that i do in the discovery documentation is i always write my problem statement because a lot of times uh, when i'm working with the pms they tend to not write their problem statements in the way it is easier for designers to understand they usually write very uh, solution based problem statements but then 
you should have like very uh, problem statements that are above the solution it should not be like solution based you should know exactly what the problem the user is facing and that's why problem statement is very necessary um then i write personas so why personas are necessary is because personas help you to understand who this particular problem that is being faced by the users is targeted so whatever solution you are going to design if it's for everyone in the on the planet it will be really hard to design that particular solution because it's not targeted to a single person or a single type of person or a, like two or three different type of person if you are saying going to say that you know like this particular uh, product or this particular feature affects everyone whoever comes onto the system then it's really hard to design that because every person is different every persona is different um also scope is something that i add in my documentation because a lot of times if you're working with product managers they want you to work on something and you come up with something else it won't be a it won't be a combination it won't be a good match up with the product manager and that's why you need to always ask the product manager or whoever you're working with said what is the scope of this exercise even if you're doing this redesign if you're doing a concept redesign or something like that on your own you should always write a scope of this exercise so that you know exactly where you want to end this exercise or where you want to land as a end goal right and then um you should put all of your research findings in a single place once they are done so that you have all the insights which you can actually take away and create mock ups and prototypes then if you are working in a if you are working in an industry like mine or even in a b2c company like you want to redesign or, or do like a food ordering app like a gojek food or you know like grab food or something like that you also need to do like very thorough competitor study which means that you have to go each screen you have to take screenshot of every screen you have to write flows for each screen which you have encountered and what are the error states what are the acceptance criteria for each and every screen and that is what the complete competitor study might look like when you are doing it on a particular tool and imagine doing that on multiple tools and then taking all of that and understanding what is good what is bad in a particular tool that will help you to refine your tool or your solution better and then a lot of times during the project i do a lot of wireframes and sketches and all and i need to put that i like to put that all in a single place so that before i start doing my mock ups and designs i can i can see all my mock ups or all my wireframes all my scribbles in a single place why i actually do this sort of a documentation or you know confluence doc is because doing designs like doing final mock ups is very costly uh doing final mock ups is a very hard process sometimes and takes a lot of time to do it but if i have a proper documentation if i have a proper research documentation i can basically make sure that whatever i'm creating or whatever mock ups or iterations i'm creating is very pinpointed i know exactly what i'm doing and tomorrow when i have to show my results to my peers or my stakeholders in the company i have all the data to show them because whenever you're taking your research or whenever you're taking your mock ups in bigger companies uh, usually stakeholders of the company like your founder co-founders you know the ctos and all these sort of folks um, in the management teams they always ask for data oh how did you come up with this particular solution how did you come up with this particular mock up uh, what data did you look at which users did you talk to uh, did you talk to the developers did you talk to the pms all these sort of questions comes in and creating a research documentation on the fly or during the start of the project helps me to document all of those things so i also do some side summary as well for all of my projects which is similar for all projects which allows me to quickly jump between different parts of the project which is like i write all the team members who were involved uh, what are their positions what capacity they were involved in product managers developers all those sort of folks a uh, lot of links floating around like you might have seen that certain uh, certain research that you see uh, when you are doing some research you come up with an article you see an article online or a blog post and if you just read it and even write down summary points and uh, link it to your research documentation tomorrow when you are like looking back and when you are uh, synthesizing your research you can look at all the documentation links or all the google doc links that are floating around Uh, so putting that all together in a single place makes a lot of sense 
in startups at least i have seen that meeting logs are an important thing because you tend to have a lot of meetings like you will have like 15 or 20 meetings per research item and that's like a i mean you need to know that okay 20 15 meetings have happened and what has been discussed in each meeting so that during the start of every meeting you can bring that knowledge to other stakeholders or other people in the meeting who might be new uh, to tell them that okay something like this has already been discussed in the previous meetings and then last but not the least um, you need to have zeppelin and prototype links in a single place as well as you need to know what is your starting point so when you are redesigning something or when you are designing something you need to you need to know if this is a what is the starting point from where you started so that when you complete the project you can compare the starting point and your end project and you know how far you have reached in the project so this is like a screenshot of what my interview feedbacks look like like usually i write my interview feedbacks in this way so i like that i write the date the role of the person the person who i'm interviewing in which company he is working in uh, what version of the prototype i'm testing so over here i'm saying the tested v2 uh, on which date the prototype was created and then what is the link of the prototype and during the interview i usually break down my interviews into three parts which is a background info like background info can be something like you know how what is the background of this person like is this person coming from which sector what is the occupation of this person how long this person has been using this particular tool or how long has this has this person been working in a particular company or my company right and then what are the problem statements is this person is coming up with uh, but beyond problems i also want to document what are the things that he or she finds useful in the product because a lot of times i don't want to redesign a product and like you know whatever things the users likes or you know apart from dislikes they also like some things i want to document those so that i don't accidentally remove those uh, i don't want at the end of the project that the user says oh but i like this th particular thing that you removed uh, i don't want that to happen because uh, in india we used to call it a, a dog and a bone problem so what happens is if you give a dog a particular bone and if he likes that bone then if you take that bone away he is going to like really shout cry or even bite you right and that is what happens with the customers as well if your customers like something then if you take away uh, that even if the customers are like 1% of the users actually like it i mean it's a very hard thing for you to take away, take it away from the users because they actually have fallen love uh, fallen in love with that particular idea or with that with that particular solution so you should never take that away from the user you should always know what are the problems and also know what are the things that are working for your product i usually do this kind of a do this kind of a you know setup or a, a structure for qualitative interviews or while i'm doing like user testing or some sort of generative interviews generative interviews are usually interviews where i'm generating new ideas from the user so i don't really know the background of the project or what ideas are going to come up with it i'm sitting in the interviews with a very open mind whatever the user is going to say i'm just going to write it over here and this is my iteration screenshot so this is the kind of iteration whenever i'm documenting my iteration i document it in this way so i'm putting things like for example uh, what is the status of this iteration on what date i have completed this iteration uh, what are the feedback that i have uh, seen or what are the feedbacks that i have basically collected from the pm from the stakeholders of the company from the users and put that all in a single place what is the current flow what is the new flow uh, what is the uh, prototype link and again a small walk through a lot of times i saw like to be very honest all of these things the screenshot that i'm sharing i have created these uh, mock ups or i have created this documentation based upon my experience of what is working in my current company and what is not working in my current company so what i have seen uh, as you can see over here i have this small place of inserting gifs or uh, gifs or mp4s why i did that is because i saw that a lot of developers or a lot of pms who were looking at my documentation do not have time to visit my prototype link and that's why i use this tool called capture or kap uh, on mac which allows me to capture a gif of the entire prototype and i put it over here so that they can quickly look over what i have done in that particular iteration 
right this saves this saves time for everyone in the, on the board and that's that that's the end of this particular kind of um, you know documentation that i do this is all that i do on my documentation and this is proven very useful for everyone on board right and before i go to my last two topics which i'll be showing um i'll be i'll be just showing you what are the things that i really value when i'm hiring new designers uh, especially who are just fresh out of college or just like completing a course or something or are transitioning into design for the first time so one i look at all the analytical skills that this person has so i'll be throwing some sort of like a very random problem that you know you have like a you have like a pothole in the road and how will you go about fixing it you have like a whole company with you you have like engineers you have like uh, you know management folks how do you communicate that there's a pothole in the road how do you figure out how to fix it and these are the things which are which are called analytical thinking or problem solving skills um like i said in terms of tools and you know processes things in startups keep changing and that's why i always look at learning to open uh, like openness to learning so a uh, lot of times i want to see if the designer is open towards learning a new tool or a new process or trying out new things because if he or she is not open towards learning then you know that that's a recipe for recipe for disaster because they'll be coming into the company and then they will be very rigid in all of their processes um uh, and plus i see a lot of new designers at least for me uh, i had the same problem uh, when i started into the design industry that whenever someone gave a very harsh feedback on my designs uh, i used to get really offended i used to get really annoyed by the fact that this person uh, said something really bad about my designs which i spent one month doing uh, and as a designer you should not be so uh, you know so attached to your designs at the end of the day you are being paid to do certain business goals to achieve certain business goals and you should be open towards changing your designs very rapidly so be you have to be very open towards taking feedback which is quite critical uh, constructive as well as rude so by rude let me give you an example of a rude feedback that i might have received long time back which is that oh your design sucks uh, this design really doesn't look good uh the button doesn't look readable uh i don't want to click on this button this button looks disabled like these kind of things like like usually you need to understand that whenever a pm or a management person gives you a feedback a lot of times it's not sugar coated it's not it's very blunt you have to be open towards taking that in a way it has been given to you a lot of times people won't take the effort to give you a feedback which is very constructive be open towards taking feedback and you should be familiar with the design tools i have already covered this point in my previous slides you should be able to present your ideas and explain design reasoning so this is very critical point in designer so if you are like weak in communication skills or if you don't if you are like scared of presenting your ideas or your research to your peers then that is something that you should work on if you are like like that is why one of the things that most companies ask you to do is that they ask you to present your design or portfolio in a sort of like a portfolio presentation because they want to test out this skill they want you to test out if you can satisfactorily explain ideas or present your ideas or your designs in a way where it can basically attract a person on the other side of the call and also invest in your research you should be able to have that ability and if you don't have it it is it can be very easily acquired by continuously presenting again and again in various forums or even between your friends or your family members you can just like go and present your portfolio to your mom and your dad and see how they react to your portfolio um, and that is one of the things that i used to do do when i was very young or when i was just starting out in the design industry i used to present my portfolio to my brother my elder brother and used to ask really weird questions to me and that really helped me that really helped me to grow my portfolio and you should be able to uh, ask very process driven questions like for example why did you do this why is this button red why did you lay out this thing in this way why not in other ways so you should be very like open towards asking these kind of critical questions or really uh, you know uncomfortable questions if you are 
not able to ask the right questions or even ask any questions at all then you are not really doing any kind of analytical reasoning so this kind of threads back to my previous point which is the first point my basic skills point and uh, i always look at this hard work to laziness factor so what i do is that whenever i'm looking at portfolios and whenever i'm looking at websites i can instantly tell that how much hard work you have spent for a particular interview like like yesterday i was taking an interview for someone and uh, he didn't bother to create a he didn't bother to create a presentation he just like directly opened their a website and showed me their portfolio which was very wordy uh, as a as a time of portfolio presentation you should be uh, you should be open towards creating a portfolio spending like 3 4 hours just creating a presentation so that you can present it to everyone because uh, imagine you have you are investing 1 hour of your time presenting whatever is you are presenting during that interview and everyone in the call let's say five people are on the call and everyone is taking out 1 hour of their time are uh, looking at your portfolio or looking at your design, design study so you should be more respectful about the fact that whatever you are presenting is respectful of your time and also their time and last but not the least i'm just going to this is my last section so before uh, i end this these are some of the books that i would recommend every one of you to read if you have not read them already this will these books will allow you to open your mind completely and will help you understand new design ideologies or methodologies or how actually design is approached in some of the bigger companies or you know bigger objects or how people work uh, with designers so creativity inc by ed catwell this is my favorite book because it talks a lot about pixar and how design processes in pixar were created and how different things are looked at uh, at the time when steve jobs was there at pixar universal design principles will allow you to basically analyze each design from a principle perspective from a more bookish perspective which is important sometimes when you are working in a very research driven sort of a role and design of everyday things if you have not read this this is a very past time sort of a book but will allow you to help understand how to design everyday things like for example a door or a, even a kettle or something like that and rocket surgery made things and uh, rocket surgery made easy and 100 things every designer should know about people are also some things which are like very simple things which you should know about design and people so rocket surgery made easy just tells you simple things that you should be doing to make design simple and things about people tell you to basically assess people before you're going into a presentation you know exactly how people think and that's how you basically carve your presentations uh that is what it teaches you like 100 things about design about people sorry and that's all that's all from me thanks thanks for attending this talk i'm going to stop sharing and answer any questions that we have Oh uh my favorite character might be Uchiha Itachi <laughs> You can also unmute yourself and ask me any questions if you have So DJ while we're waiting for the questions to come in um I just wanted to hear your thoughts also on networking in the industry um do you do this actively as well and do you have any tips for them on how they can start especially now that there're no events physical events what would be like any platforms that you would usually use in your community so i mean i would say that at least for this time when there is no physical event happening uh, start using the the meetups platform like start attending a lot of meetups lot of webinars it will also open up your mind it will help you understand new ideologies like a lot of designers from zendesk facebook uh, google all of these bigger companies they are actually facing uh, like sharing their design ideologies uh, on social platforms or in a form of a free webinar and it's a 
I think I, I think I'm really happy about this fact, which is that because of COVID nineteen, I'm able to uh, I'm able to attend these talks easily. Uh, I do not need to fly to Europe to basically at, attend or talk, see talking a Google designer or a you know Facebook designer. Uh, I can attend their talks from the comfort of my home, and that is really important for me to see. Um, but beyond that, I think uh, you can attend these talks, and everyone on LinkedIn is. Uh, if you can approach a person with a, a nicely written cover letter or a nicely written question or answer, I'm I'm very open that like most of the people on LinkedIn will be able to help you out with it. Like there's no uh, like people are very scared sometimes to ask these kind of questions uh, to a stranger or do some sort of like cold mailing to designers, fellow designers who who they don't know. But I think they should not be uh, that scared about it because. like most designers that i have met they are very helpful if you go and ask them any question about their design process or you know how to take feedback and all these sort of things i'm i'm very sure that most of them will answer your questions or will be very keen to even get on a call with you i've done that a lot i have i've used things like adp list or design.org to basically get on random calls with designers across the globe uh, to get on a mentorship call help understand what they are doing and how i can improve my design studies how i can ask better questions to do research and these kind of things okay um, so i have a lot of questions over here now coming so how important is having a mentor for a new designer starting out i think i think uh, having a mentor is really important because uh, a lot of times uh, like designers new designers uh, fall into pitfalls uh, fall into things which they should not idly and a uh, usually a mentor will be able to tell you that like a mentor will be able to tell you that how to basically approach a design like i wish when i was starting out as a designer i was told by fellow designers to do this 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 but unfortunately when i was starting out in the design industry like there was design industry was not really existent at that time like 9 years 10 years back and there was no real design gurus out there i had to figure out everything by myself so i think that's like treat mentors as a shortcut for you to basically learn new things or for you to make lesser mistakes or make new mistakes which maybe these folks have not made right um i hope that answers your questions if not please ask me more um what soft skills do you think is important for a ux designer uh, so i think two two of the soft skills which is important is that you should be able to uh explain your ideas a lot of problem a lot of things that i see with designers is they are not able to explain their reasoning it's just in your head like right now i have done this design i have done this button is like blue color like why is this button blue color like people tend to ask these kind of questions especially who are people who are non designers and you as a designer should be able to articulate these things you should be able to tell okay this is the exact reason why i'm using red for notifications this is the exact reason why i'm using blue for uh, like links or buttons or something like that like it shouldn't be like oh i just felt like i want to do it like it shouldn't be like that uh, and plus like i said you should be able to present your ideas so presenting your ideas and analytical reasonings are two of the underrated soft skills that i feel um, should be there and beyond that if you are sitting in a in a design role or design research sort of a role i would say that be open towards listening to people rather than talking uh, i know myself that i'm of a fault in that kind of a aspect that i used to i talk a lot but then if you can if you can hold back if you can basically take back your thoughts and basically just listen to the other person saying something then you can learn a lot of things from that from that person okay how do you keep up with the latest design trends what resources do you use to inspire yourself um so in terms of the latest design trends i usually always follow people on twitter or medium like i said those are the two places which i from where i usually look at all my design trends um i i tend to not go on places like dribble uh, because dribble is very visual dri ui driven a uh, lot of new designers are attracted towards dribble but i am not that attracted towards dribble because it does not give you a design reasoning of how you zero down on a particular solution 
and uh, just to keep myself inspired i usually just uh, open up again i open up twitter or sometimes i even up, open up pinterest just to look at like a lot of gifs and a lot of design gifs and you know branding projects and everything else just to so that i can be inspired about you know what kind of color palettes and what kind of layouts i should be using in my designs can you please tell us about the least successful project you ever worked on either by yourself or in a team how did you how did you or the team get through this okay so i was in my previous company uh, and even my current company uh, i was working in a growth project so what i did as a growth designer was uh, if you don't know growth designers what they do is that they they basically work like a dartboard so you have a dartboard and you basically throw like hundred thousands of pins on top of it on the dartboard and if something sticks you win so the whole idea is to throw as many pins as possible on the dartboard so that at least one of the pins stick on top of it so i was working in the growth team and one of the things that i did was i i wanted to create this survey project which is to collect surveys across the board and uh, i had this very big de- dream of creating a survey project which is having so many criss cross details and questions and all these sort of framework that i created for the for the next two or three months and then when i actually went through user tested it and figured out what is the usability fact of it i understood that whatever i did for the past three months or so it's a complete waste of time because no one wanted that product people already were using google forms or type form or something like that to conduct service and they didn't really want that kind of a project to be you know there in inside the company that i was working hike messenger and uh, what i did was rather than just crying over that spilled milk i actually created a plan for myself that next time whenever i'm doing a project i will be doing these kind of steps like i'll be doing the research i'll be doing a competitor research i'll be doing a stakeholder management or a stakeholder alignment research so that i know exactly what i'm going into uh, this kind of showed me that okay whenever i'm going into a new project i should do some sort of like bare bones research so that i know if whatever i'm doing even makes sense or the client really wants it or the customer really wants it or else i'm just like wasting my time for the next 2 or 3 months um did you encounter any challenge when switching from an engineer to visual designer how did you overcome it and how long did it take you for you to complete the switch yes so being an engineer i think one of the things that uh, was hard for me was i was always looking at the development perspective of a design so i used to always create designs which are easy to develop or easy to code and that is one of the biggest problems because as a designer if you are always thinking about how developers are going to code this before you even check out with the users or with you know like the stakeholders in the company you are always thinking about yourself you are always thinking about your team members before your users it should be the other way around you should always think about the users and then you take it to the tech team show it to them and basically figure out a middle middle ground like there's not going to be always a solution where whatever you create for the users is going to be exactly what your tech team is very comfortable doing but there has to be a middle ground that you need to reach but if you are always thinking technology first then you will not be able to do any justice to the user first approach and i i think i think how i overcome it is by uh, getting rejected a lot of times like to be honest when i started out in design i used to be very um, self centered i used to feel like whatever designs i used to create that i'll be creating will be accepted immediately by the co-founders founders or the users and when i went through this cycle i saw that like there's like so many instances which i can recall that like my re- designs would get rejected for 6 months on the on the go like for 6 months i joined the company and did not ship anything in the company uh and during the start of the 6 months i was very confident that within the next 15 days i'll be able to ship something but that was not the case i learned that through a hard way that like whatever you are thinking might not be the way other people in the company might be thinking so i mean be open towards feedback be open towards trying out new things that is what i learned through this whole process and always think user first not technology first 
how does your previous experience contribute to your current role as a product designer so i i think something which is which i actually hated when i started as a designer was that i uh, i thought i always wasted four years of my life studying engineering uh, and not studying like a design role like for example i did not do a masters in design or a bachelors in like uh, design communication or like ux design and i always felt like you know that is something that i that i did not belong in the design industry uh, that everyone feels like like i felt like i am a imposter who is trying to pass on as a designer but that is not the case what i felt was the more i started working with the developers the more i've started working in startup industry not in like agencies or studios i realized that product designers need to work with highly technical people like developers every day every now and then and if you don't know how to speak their language uh, it's very hard to communicate with the developers so every time you are like working with a developer you will realize that there are so many things that developers will say that will just go above your head and if you can just understand their vocabulary uh, that would be awesome so like just to give you an example if you talk to a designer if i ask you to talk to a developer versus a designer you will always try to talk to a designer because designer the a fellow designer and you basically say the same vocabulary basically you speak the same vocabulary and that is something that i learned as a developer i i can basically talk to a developer now and i can speak the same vocabulary if you cannot speak the same vocabulary to a developer then he or she would not be interested in you he would he or she would look at your project in a very alienated way and you don't want to do that you want to speak to their vocabulary just as you want them to speak the, your vocabulary and i think uh, the more you can basically uh, talk to them in a way where how they can understand you uh, you can basically convert developers over time into your design advocates so if you if you are just advocating design a company yourself then it's a very uphill task according to me but if you start advocating design to fellow developers and they come on board they are basically like yes whatever whatever stefani is saying is awesome whatever stefani is saying is like uh, something that i agree i agree to this design ideology then they can go into their own design uh, in their own development forums or engineering forums and they can advocate your designs i have seen a lot of times de- developers would go to forums and they would uh, even if i am not there in the meetings they would be rallying around they will be showing my designs to fellow developers and that's a win win for me because now i can't be present in every meeting but if they can advocate for me that's a awesome thing oh dj to add on to that topic we have a follow up question from sara at the bottom of the chat so okay. for someone who does not have a lot of understanding of coding or the technical aspect and is creating a web for developers is there a best way of communicating with them <coughs> so i think i think yes there is a easier way to do this but then you will get into a lot of conversation with the developers where they will be asking you very uh, uncomfortable questions because you don't have coding and technical knowledge they might look like very uncomfortable but there is one very shortcut way of actually going around it you don't need to be an engineer to do that uh, and which is that you can read documentation so if you are if you are like doing an android code or if you are doing an material design a uh, redesign or a material design uh, code you can basically go to material design guidelines and you can start reading that and basically pick up words from those material design guidelines or human interface guidelines from apple or even from w3 schools uh, and basically this uh, use that in your vocabulary over here and there when you're talking to the developers what that will help is developers will have will have certain sort of respect for you they will understand that okay this person has taken some sort of effort to understand coding to understand a little bit about my um, you know my field of expertise and that's i i feel like most people most developers will be able to respond to that in a very positive way versus that you just come into the platform and you say i don't know anything about coding or i don't know anything about development and i have not done my research treat reading a documentation reading material design documentation as a research project of your own does that answer your question sarah 
Oh uh, yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Interesting to uh, interesting to hear about how you connect with other designers, and some of them, some of them are mentors. Could you share some resources where we can tap on to connect with other designers who are willing to provide mentorship to new designers? Um, I think design dot org and ADP list. Uh, those are the two platforms that uh, designers are currently using very heavily. Uh, you can go to ADP list. There is like Calendly link for each and every designer over there. Their positions, their country, whatever you want to filter according to your interests. Uh, maybe you want to talk to a fellow Singaporean, or you want to talk to someone who is working in Google or Facebook. Uh, if that is your goal, you can just like go to ADP list, search for those designers, and uh, just connect with them. Just schedule a time slot with them and uh, prepare a set of questionnaires before you go onto the mentor chat, and basically. Tap onto that. Uh, add them onto the LinkedIn chat. Onto uh, add them onto your LinkedIn connection, and then keep asking questions. Keep asking, um, you know, like any design queries that you have, and I'm I'm positive that they'll be able to help you out with it. Okay, which pages do you follow on Instagram and Twitter? Uh, I'm not very active on Instagram. Uh, I'm not really active on Instagram, at least for the professional side. Uh, but on Twitter, I'm following a lot of pages. Like for example, uh, Julie Zhao. Like I have my uh, Twitter open over here. So I have Julie Zhao, who, who was an ex VP of design at Facebook, and she has really nice uh, stuff. And she's like currently she just resigned from Facebook, and she has his own recruitment company coming up in US. And she always shares these things which you as a designer should be able to do. And even if you're Going from an individual contributor to a managerial role, how should you fare that? Then there are people like Joey Banks. Uh, I can I can basically share some of the people with Stefani with Melanie, and they can pass on the pages to you. But there are like a lot of pages. Like I follow a lot of people on um, on uh, Twitter. Uh, some of the people are Jared Spool, like Jared Spool, uh, Figma, Sketch. These kind of pages are also very interesting because. They usually share a lot of things about design ideologies, and then always follow some some medium pages like, for example, UX Collective, Prototyper, UX Planet. All of these pages are really interesting because they post up articles uh, written by other designers on Twitter, and you can basically follow up on that. Read a lot of uh, read a lot of these uh, case studies and design case studies. You will also understand how to write your own design case study. After reading those design case studies posted by other experienced designers. Yep, that's mostly it. All the questions have been answered. Great. So thanks, DJ. Um, so as I've mentioned to you, um, this batch is actually graduating in a few weeks' time. So just to close the session, um, did you have any other pieces of advice that you wanted to share with them? Any closing remarks? Um, I think I think uh, if you are like struggling to uh, land a job or if you're struggling to land an interview, uh, always think that your portfolio itself is a design project. Always look at your portfolio as a design project. So you need to do research. You need to do iterations for each of your portfolio. And uh, I think I think find right now finding a job is a full time job. Like finding a job is a full time job, and you need to realize that finding a job means creating a portfolio and creating, refining your analytical skills, refining your presentation skills. And that is what the job description looks like for you right now. Uh, if you can stay true to that and you can keep applying to companies and reaching out to fellow people on LinkedIn, um, I think you should be able to uh, land a job very quickly and very easily. Uh, also, one of the things that most uh, freshers don't do or new people don't do uh, is that Sometimes companies do not have design roles open uh, or do not have design roles listed on their website, but you can still reach out to design managers and basically ask them that are they hiring a fresher or an intern or someone like that. And sometimes it just like opens up gates. Like, like one of my friends recently got a design internship in TransferWise and there was no internship opportunity in TransferWise, but he just like pinged uh, a particular person uh, onto the LinkedIn and just asked around if he can basically intern at TransferWise and he basically got an opportunity to interview with them. So 
always do that like do some sort of cold mailing do some sort of cold messaging on linkedin or any other platform like twitter and all and maybe sometimes like let's say 50% of times you might not get a response from every designer but the other 50% of times you will get a response from some designers and i think that's enough i think that's that should be enough to get you started you just need one yes you might have like thousands of no's but yeah one yes that's enough that's all you need yeah that's so true so yeah thank you thank you so much dj for your time today and also for your tips excellent tips and also hearing more about what you do in zinier so um i guess we'll also just wait for that list if uh since people asked about your following list on twitter as well so i can share that with them and yeah that's all for today thank you everyone thank you again dj thank you thank you for having me <laughs> thanks okay. have a good week bye thank thanks dj thank you